Hello everyone. Welcome to an exclusive webinar organized by Bosch India. Thanks for joining us today. I am Divya, the moderator for the session. We are going to learn about why your company needs an OSS compliance and governance strategy. Before I hand it over to the presenters, a few ground rules. Please do not put your phones on hold. Participants will be muted during the presentation. We will address all the questions at the end of the presentation to conserve time. So please feel free to begin posting questions in the chat box. The presentation cannot be downloaded unless permission is granted from the presenter. Over to you, Mr. Roy. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, dear viewers. Welcome to this webinar on the topic of why your company needs an OSS governance and compliance strategy. We are really glad that you could join us. First, a disclaimer. This is for you to read on the screen. Whatever is conveyed in this webinar shall not constitute legal advice and there is no attorney-client relationship established. We would like for you to engage with us and um, you have the opportunity to do that in various ways. There is the chat box through which you can type. You can ask us questions using the question box, which we'll be later answering in the Q&A session. We also have a poll that will be displayed just before the Q&A. Uh, please take your time to put in your responses there. After the webinar ends, there would be a survey where you could give us feedback, and we would really appreciate your feedback on this. Uh, at any time during the webinar, you are encouraged to download the handout files. So those are PDF files which describe the OSS offerings from Bosch India and a PDF file about software operations within Bosch in general. If you'd like to contact us, please drop in a mail at OSS support at Bosch at in.bosch.com. That is OSS hyphen support at in.bosch.com. If you would like us to visit your organization and give a presentation on awareness or the processes or get into details of anything presented in this slide, we'd be more than ha well uh, happy to do that for you. And finally, this webinar will be archived at the link shown on the screen. Um, the video uh, can be shared with your colleagues as well as friends. And we'd really appreciate if you do that. All right, so we have a quick agenda listed out on the screen right now. Uh, this entire webinar would be for 60 minutes. Uh, we would have an introduction of all the panel members on and why this webinar is hosted in the first place. We would go into basics. We would go into copyright licenses. License types, copyleft, and license conflicts would be some of the topics addressed there. Then we would have need for OSS compliance, where we'd look into case studies, some risks, consequences involved in non-compliance. Finally, we would have Bosch OSS. So that is where we would be presenting some of the key learnings and how the processes are established within our organization. We'd be touching upon strategies and uh, governance. After which we'd have a quick poll and then a Q&A. So please start typing in your questions already. Let's move on. Bosch India, also known as RBEI, has been operating in the area of OSS compliance and governance for eight plus years. And we have completely, completely and successfully done 2,000 plus OSS compliance projects. We have with us today key members who would be able to share their experiences with you in this webinar. 
I am glad to announce to you, sorry, to introduce to you Mr. Arun, who would be the engineering manager and overall governance for OSS operations within India. Welcome, Arun. Thank you, Raj. Hello, everyone. I'm glad he could be with us. So the next thumbnail is of myself. I work as a delivery lead for OSS in the car multimedia section within Bosch projects. The next, we have our legal expert joining us, Mr. Satya. He deals with IP matters at Bosch. I'm glad he could be with us for the webinar. Hello. Hello, Satya. Finally, I'd like to introduce to you Nagashree, who is the auditor and reviewer. She has varied experience in various kinds of projects within car multimedia divisions in Bosch. Thank you, Nagashree, for joining us. Thanks, Roy. Hello, everyone. If you'd like to contact any of us, you may do so via our LinkedIn profiles available on the event page. And that is the same link that I presented to you earlier. And we'd be glad to hear your feedback, comments, and queries on our OSIS topics. So now we come to why this webinar. Well, we all know that corporate use of open source is now the norm with more than 90% of companies saying that they build their products with open source software. That is 90%. In fact, according to a recent report from Center for Open Source Research and Innovation, uh, the research report points out that open source comprises 90% of the code in a typical application. These surveys also reveal that most companies that use FOS in their products don't have formal procedures in place for ensuring that their sof software complies with open source licenses and regulations. So that's why we have this webinar. This is to first of all provide with to you the awareness so that your companies can be ready. Next, we have lots of different definitions out there. And through this webinar, we hope to bring clarity to you on some of these terms and some of the processes that are involved in OSS compliance and governance. We all know that all of software development now uses FOSS knowingly or unknowingly. According to research studies conducted in 2018 um, that is named Open Source Security and Risk Analysis, Many applications now contain more open source than proprietary code. The average percentage of code base that was open source was 57% when compared to proprietary code. So we will see later on that without the use of open source components and platforms, it is nearly impossible to gain a foothold in many industries. The other reason why we have this webinar is to show the risks that are present if we do not take non-compliance issues seriously. Though we have many advantages to using OSS, many companies are not prepared to tackle the risks associated with using OSS components. There is also a tremendous and increasing risk that these open source components can be compromised by attackers. These attackers leverage security vulnerabilities within OSS components. And because OSS is used throughout the industry and across industries, the impact is to millions and billions of people. A very plausible example in today's world could be a vulnerability existing in an OSS component, which is used in say a ride hailing app like Uber, which if personal identifying information is available within such applications, attackers could potentially discover the location and destination of people that they'd like to target. So we are facing real risks when using open source. So we would be throwing more light on these in future slides. There are legal lawsuits that can happen if non-compliance is not done and all of the obligations are not met while using OSS components we would be touching upon some use cases there. We would like also to talk about governance. So this is the case 
where um, if an organization does not define the hierarchy and the workflows and processes to have OSS compliance, then it could erode the company's standing in the industry. It can diminish the company's influence in projects that they rely on and can also lead to loss of IP, loss of money, and other complications. Let's move on to common myths about OSS. So we all assume that open source software means free of cost. This is definitely not true. As mentioned earlier, there are development costs involved. In addition to this, it is essential that necessary steps are taken by organizations to employ OSS governance, such that the use of OSS components can go through these various established processes. This could be well worth it to ensure that your applications and products do not face legal costs, injunction, injunction orders, or loss of IP due to non-compliance. The other myth that people have is OSS cannot be used for commercial purposes. So just as the reports that were quoted earlier, 90% of corporate commercial applications actually use OSS components in their products. So that is the reality. Another myth that people have is unspecified licensed software belongs to no one and therefore everyone can use it. Contrary to what people generally understand, software code which does not specify a license is still fully copyrighted. Until software is passed into the public domain or covered by a different license, it is not legally usable. All right, so the next myth that people hold is OSS is riskier since authors do not provide any warranties. Um, well, here again, I'd just like to say as an example, even Microsoft releases some software under OSS, OSS licenses. So you are actually safe to use both proprietary and open source software. The only condition is you have to use this wisely and within the compliance terms. If you use it wisely, then you already mitigate the risks. Another myth that people hold is that OSS software does not have bugs or vulnerabilities. This is again not true. Um, OSS software does have bugs and vulnerabilities and this is one of the reasons why it is very essential for us to address these in OSS governance topics so that bugs are identified, vulnerabilities are known before it goes to market. Let's move on. We'll touch upon some basics. What are the kind of software we generally hear about? We hear about freeware. These are software that are free to use, but with no source code. An example is Skype and Adobe Flash. We use this freely, but we do not get the source code for them. Here's another example of software that we generally hear about, Shareware. Shareware is software that is distributed free on a trial basis with the understanding that the user may need or want to pay for it later. Let's look at a few examples. Have you used Adobe Photoshop or WinRAR? Both of these are shareware. Next, let's look at free software. Free software is software that provides four essential freedoms to the user. These rights emphasize user's freedom, and we will look into it more detail later. The next category we have is open source software. This is software where the source code of the software is available to the users. It may or may not be free. And software under this category has to satisfy the open source definition as per OSI. We will again look into detail later. Finally, we have as a general category, closed source slash proprietary. This is the kind of software that does not provide or share the source code. An example would be Microsoft products. Now I'd like to take you through free software and FSF quickly. So this is just a quick basic on, the, on these movements. Free software is a movement that was started by Richard Stallman in 1985. And the main objective was to really provide the user freedoms in using software. 
there is a term that we generally hear free as in freedom or free as in speech versus free as in beer. So when we talk about freedom in software, it is a matter of liberty. Like when we say freedom of speech, it's not just the ability to get the software for free. Let's look at the four freedoms warranted by the Free Software Foundation. That is freedom to run the software however you like. So that means if you have a software that can run on a calculator, you're free to do that. We have the second freedom, which is to see how the software works and modify it. This is to say that the source code should be made available and any user of the software should be able to use, uh, to view the uh, source code and to be able to modify it. The next freedom would be freedom to distribute the software however you like. So if you decide to distribute the software to your friends via email or via link to a public cloud, that also can be done. So this is the freedom guaranteed by free software. And finally, the freedom to distribute the modified version of the software. Now let's look at open source initiative. OSI was formed in 1998. The term open source was adopted and made popular by OSI. The mission of OSI is to explain and protect the open source label. It was founded to be an educational and an advocacy and stewardship organization to make open source popular, to define the open source definition and to maintain a list of OSI approved licenses. Examples of these are GPL2, GPL3, AGPL, Apache, etc. Let's look at some of the, the let's look at the 10 conditions which define open source software according to OSI. So we have free distribution. That is to say that I should be able to freely distribute the software however, li however I like. The source code should be made available. We should not use obfuscated code, but it should be made freely available. Then we have um, derived works, that is a license which enables that software to be modified and so on. I just read it out for you, integrity of the author's source code. The license, the open source license should maintain um, the condition that no discrimination against persons or groups. That is to say that for competitive advantage, the source code should not be limited to only a particular group. Next, we have the condition, no discrimination against fields of endeavor. We have distribution of license. That license must not be specific to a product. License must not restrict other software. And that the license must be technologically, technology neutral. And in layman terms, these are the differences between FSF and OSI. So FSF is social is a social movement, whereas OSI is a development methodology. FSF values users' freedom, while OSI values practical ways to make the software better. FSF is concerned in making the four freedoms available to every user, whereas OSI uh, maintains licenses which uh, is OSI approved only if it satisfies the open source definition, which we just looked at. So let's look at why FOSS is so prevalent in the industry. I'd like to read a quote for you. This is from Stephen J. Vaughan Nichols for Linux and Open Source. And this is from February 2nd, 2018, about a year ago. And he said, every company in the world now uses open source software. Microsoft, one of its greatest enemy, is now an enthusiastic open source supporter. Even Windows is now built using open source techniques. And if you ever search in Google, bought a book from Amazon, watched a movie on Netflix, or looked at your friend's vacation pictures on Facebook, you are an open source user. It's certainly not bad for a technology approach that turns 20 on February 3rd. So I've listed out here a couple of reasons why FOSS is so prevalent in the industry. It is a springboard for software development. It reduces the time to market. There's less technical expertise required. 
free and open source software provides security and stability. It scales better than proprietary software. It is also more portable since the source code is available. We get support from OSS communities and we can even give back to the community. And finally, cost is which is a major concern for startups and other organizations. All right, so now I'd like to hand over to my colleague Nagashree, who will take us through the next section named licenses. Thanks, Roy, for the detailed explanation and giving the background information of open source software. So yeah, now we are going to discuss on software licenses. Before looking into the introduction, let's talk about the copyright. Copyright is defined as a person's exclusive right to reproduce, publish, or sell his or her original work of authorship. Now let's look into the bulletin points mentioned. The subject matter pertains to the software. The primary goal of copyright law is to protect the time, effort, and creativity of the creator's work. As such, the Copyright Act gives the author of a particular software bundle of rights granted under copyright law, which includes right to use the software, right to modify, and right to redistribute. Now, the author has a choice of providing any of those rights to others, and this intention of author is conveyed via license terms and conditions. While uh, the author is granting any of those rights could also impose certain restrictions for example obligations so we will discuss regarding the obligations in the latest slides yeah so now we will look into the differences of free open source software and the proprietary software so now what is free open source software so free open source software is a software that can be classified as both free software and open source software. That is, anyone is freely licensed to use, copy, study, and change the software in any way. And the source code is openly shared so that people are encouraged to voluntarily improve the design of the software. So here we could see a few of the advantages as well as the features of free open source software so now i'm looking in now i'm taking you to the first feature that is no license fees for any use or purpose of free open source software the excellent advantage of making use of the software is that it is generally obtainable for free users simply need to download the program from online and begin using using it hence there is no license fee and the second advantage we are looking into is the right to use granted to everyone there is a equal rights there is a equal rights which are granted to everyone to use the open source software and the next one we have is uh, the source code available source code is available since uh, the authors makes his source code available to others who would like to view the code copy it learn from it alter it or share it and now we could look into the modification deriv derivative works allowed in free open source software the capability to modify the program According to the needs is the major difference among the closed source and the open source software. The choice of modifying the source, modifying the software enables developers to make a solution that uh, particularly targets the needs of their customers. So the enterprises and companies can just extract the utmost advantage from this feature because they can get modified solutions for controlling their daily activities. This is about the modification part in false. And now we're looking to the redistribution that is allowed in free open source software. Yeah, 
in this way when the users you extract the utmost advantages from this feature they can modify the solution as well they could also redistribute the software now looking into the copyright protected FOSS is copyright protected authors could protect their work by just copywriting it and now the last but not the least we have the warranties liability disclaimed within FOSS warranty is just a guarantee made by the vendor against potential liabilities arising from the use of a product so all FOSS licenses come within a warranty disclaimer such classes are designed to protect the author of FOSS programs so the author licenses and distributors of FOSS have disclaimed all warranties related to any liability arising from the use and distribution of FOSS so these are the features and advantages of free open source software so now we'll look into the proprietary software so what is proprietary software proprietary software is owned by an individual or a company there are there are almost always a major restrictions on its use and its source code is always kept secret so this is what a uh, basic about the proprietary software now here we could see uh, the drawbacks or the features of proprietary software. So first I'll take you to the license fees generally applicable in case of proprietary software. One of the biggest drawbacks of any proprietary software is that the license fee. Since developers sell their product, they charge you for access their product. And now I'm taking you to the usage rights restricted in proprietary. And then we have the modifications, creations of derivative works generally not permitted in proprietary software. And in proprietary, we are not permitted to reproduce or redistribute the sources. Yes, so this is about the features and drawbacks and the advantages and features of FOSS and proprietary. So now let's move on to the open source soft licenses. So basically, what is a license? Open source license is a type of license for computer software and other products that allows the source code to be used, modified, or shared under defined times and terms and conditions. So basically, we have two categories of licenses in OSS. One is permissive, and the other one is non-permissive. We also refer to as, we also call the non-permissive as restricted license. Under restrictive license, we also have subcategories that is weak copyleft license and a strong copyleft license or just a copyleft license. Now, what is permissive license? It is just a free software license with a minimal requirement about how the software can be redistributed. Example, BSD, MIT, and Apache. So here we could distribute the software under any license terms and conditions the software could initially be redistributed under uh, the any license terms and conditions and the sources of the software need not to be published and make the available source code of the OSS component to others so this is about permissive and the next is the copyleft license so initially like Basically, what is copyleft? Copyleft license is when an author releases a program under a copyleft license, he makes a claim on the copyright of the work and issues a statement that other people have the right to use, modify, and share the work as long as uh, the reciprocity obligation is maintained. So in this, we have the subcategories as weak copyleft and a copyleft license, which is also called as strong copyleft. So we copyleft refers to the licenses where uh, not all the derived works inherit the copyleft licenses. And in case of copyleft, copyleft license, strong copyleft license refers to the licenses where all the derivative works inherit the copyleft license. So these are the major differences between the we copyleft and the strong copyleft licenses. Yeah. So for your better understanding, we have taken a usage scenario where we have taken the permissive license BSD, we have taken the weak 
weak copyleft license EPL and strong copyleft license GPL. And we are going to explain you how these licensed components, when it is getting get it integrated with the proprietary code, what will be the effect? So let's see what happens when BSD licensed component gets integrated with the proprietary code. So the resultant product license would include both the both the components, the BSD licensed component and the proprietary code. But since BSD is a permissive license, the BSD license terms could be full obligations could be fulfilled by the proprietary code and the product could be released under the proprietary license. So this is in case of permissive. And the next is weak copyleft, where when EPL license is, get, is getting integrated with the proprietary code, we could see there is a EPL license separately distributed or license EPL licenses licensed code are licensed under EPL only and the proprietary code is released under proprietary code. So this happens in case where since EPL is a weak copyleft, we will have to provide the source code. But where for proprietary software, we, we only give the binaries. Hence, EPL remains under EPL only. And then we have the strong copyleft license GPL. Here, when GPL is getting interact, integrated with the proprietary code, we could see the entire proprietary code is also is also under GPL. So this is a scenario where when a strong copyleft license GPL gets linked to the proprietary code, the overall license would have a copyleft effect where proprietary is proprietary in case of proprietary code, we just give the binary. But as per the obligations or the license terms of GPL, we should give the source code to the next recipient. So in this case, since there is a conflict between the GPL license terms and a proprietary, the code under proprietary will also have to follow the license terms of GPL. In that way, the entire product would be given under GPL license and the entire product source code will be distributed to the other recipient. So this is the usage scenario we could see within the different categories of license. And now here we are taking you to the license rights and obligations with respect to GPL V2 license. So basically an obligation is a course of action uh, that someone is required to take, whether legal or moral. Obligations are requirements which must be fulfilled. Uh, these are the general, generally legal obligations which can incur a penalty for non-fulfillment. So basically, we could see there are license rights for GPL2 and there are few license obligations as well. So the license rights are given to the author where when author is using the GPL licensed component. And obligations are the terms or the restrictions that the GPL license defines and which need to be fulfilled by the author when he is using the GPL V2 licensed component within his product. So here we could see some of the rights, for example, uh, the right of distribution. So here the right says when you are using the GPL V2 licensed component, you have the right to distribute the source code. And for example, in license obligation, if you look into the providing source code, it is just like when you are using the sources of GPL V2 component, you must provide the source code of the GPL V2 software. So this is about the rights and obligations with respect to GPL V2. Yeah, uh, this is all about the license section. Now we have our lawyer Satya who will take further on the slides. Thank you. Hello. Uh, so let's go into the next topic that is uh, need for versus compliance and governance. Uh, 
you you must have all got a fair understanding about the basics of open source and then uh, the following on the license topics so you know this uh, when coming to the oss complaint so the i you know it is understandable that open source comes with a lot of advantage and it is widely used and you know the complaint way of implementation is something that is very important when that goes missing there are something that can follow up so you know what are the aspects that are related to the complaints when the complaints is not proper or you know in basically in terms of complaints uh, what are issues that can rise so first topic is this uh, you know license compatibility so we saw uh, you know yeah, when a product development happens it is not just uh, one open source code uh, piece that might be used there might be several uh, co uh, open source code or third party code the proprietary code that is developed in house will form part of a product so you know uh, i mean uh, when considering the open source uh, the, it was also introduced to you all uh, earlier by nagashri on this uh, you know different categories of license so it could be permissive copyleft uh, so all these categories or a number of uh, you know of, uh, code under various copyleft license could also be there now uh, you know the, you could refer to the second image there on the right so that gives an impression uh, you know it says that a code under gpl and then a code under mpl is also in the product with proprietary code so you know uh, as you must be aware this gpl is under a strong copyleft license and mpl is again under a, a weak copyleft license now you know copyleft license itself suggests that a code whatever was available to the recipient under certain terms and conditions has to be redistributed under the same terms and conditions so you know mpl has to be distributed under its own terms and conditions and likewise gpl has to be go, has to go under the same terms and conditions so now how do we you know fulfill the same uh, you know terms and conditions of these licenses when it forms part of the same product either we fulfill gpl or mpl it cannot be to, together both cannot be fulfilled so there is a conflicting scenario that arises here so this has to be handled so this is one of the uh, you know issue that can be in way of using open source code in uh, a product development so moving further uh, so and another thing is that you know it is appreciable fact that in uh, in product building uh, you know a, a employee sitting inside an organization you know develop uh, in is involved in developing the code they can uh, use open source from several sources that is available online uh, they could just download and uh, integrate it as part of their uh, development environment so you know there is also other scenarios that can be possible that is you know if a supplier is uh, you know contacted uh, to supply some software package for the product development so through supplier could also have integrated some open source as part of this product so that also has to be a pointer and complaints with respect to that though it is a responsibility of supplier it has to be ensured by the organization which finally releases the product so uh, the other aspect is uh, regarding the code generators and debuggers they there also there is possibility of open source getting introduced so complaints with respect to all of this has to be ensured so when complaints is not ensured what are the uh, risks that can be uh, possibly foreseen are the pointers which you see it on your to is your right so the first thing is liability so none of the open source that comes along or is available uh, you know come uh, the author uh, disclaims any of the liability that is associated with the code so which means that when a open piece of open source code is used in the product then it is who it is the organization or the person who is involved in development of the product assumes assumes the liability for the usage of open source so the next pointer is uh, third party ip infringement so the a piece of code which is uh, open source uh, the author of uh, the code whoever created it may have uh, created it on its own or even uh, copied it from somewhere where there is a possibility of some copyright infringement or you know the code might also infringe a, a patent uh, so this is not something uh, what was validated at his hand so he has uh, he possibly has disclaimed this in the license so it is up to whoever uh, takes it up and use it uh, to ensure that there is no possible third party infringement that comes along so the next point is warranty there is clearly no warranty that is provided by the author and it's for the product owner to provide the warranty to his customers moving forward uh, the next one is the copyright infringement so you know the license enforces uh, certain conditions 
to be you know uh, followed uh, in way of obligations could be or there are certain restrictions that is not allowed or the whatever rights that is granted is could be enjoyed uh, you know when certain things are fulfilled as per the license so uh, you know when when these uh, whatever obligation is required is not fulfilled so you know the flow of license is not there i mean whatever rights granted uh, gets annulled so thereby you know we use the open source code we use the open source code because of the rights being granted then later on uh, because of not follow complying with certain obligations the possibility is that the license is no more valid and we don't enjoy any further right over the license so it becomes a copyright infringement scenario there so moving to the next pointer is uh, you know uh, we could call it as viral effect in legal language uh, in legal language it equates to copyleft effect uh, you know the license wherever the possibility of creative creation of derivative work or somewhere as the license requires the source code to be released under the same terms and condition so we might have to comply with it if the comply uh, that complication will arise according to the usage of the code so the next one is uh, you know a, there could be possibility of uh, loss of ip so we use a piece of code uh, and then the entire product uh, could possibly uh, you know have take this uh, copy of effect and be under the uh, uh, you know we might be in a position to get uh, release the entire source code under the license of the open source code that we use because of which on that topic if there is any patent that is held by the company or any of the sister concerns so the possibility is that uh, all those patents might also be granted via the the license that uh, the product gets released under so moving further uh, so the legal consequences what is foreseen so when uh, open source code is used there are certain things that has to be fulfilled so when those things are not fulfilled and what are the consequences uh, that can possibly arise is that we are going to look in here so one thing is that you know uh, possibility is that they might have to disclose the entire source code of their product which makes no sense because uh, you know a, a company uses the open source code for its advantage and uh, wants to cut down on the cost and the employee uh, effort so the next possible uh, risk or the consequence will be the you know facing damages uh, you know there can be uh, you know because of uh, non compliance the one of the relief that is claimed uh, in a suit could be damages and it could run tunes to my millions so uh, the next one would be injector relief so you know um, before even a case could be decided on merit if someone wants an interim relief and they could uh, you know whoever is suing a company for uh, non compliant use of open source they could have the products of the company uh, stopped and not being marketed uh, the product could even get manufactured but then you know commercially uh, selling it uh, might be banned because of the injector relief so it is a very terrible situation when company invest in manufacturing the goods but is not able to sell it on the market so the next one would be you know the product recall so say suppose a, a, a company is involved in uh, you know b2b business where it delivers uh, products to uh, you know oem the oem puts it in uh, uh, some uh, end user product and then delivers it to n number of users now product recalls not just affects the company who used open source but also the customer relationship it had with oem also gets affected there so all these situations none of the company would want to face it so you know these are the consequences that you know is a real bad nature the, that's why the proper open source complaints had to be in place in a company so uh, maybe uh, there have been in past as well uh, uh, a number of cases that had been uh, you know faced by a number of companies uh, however uh, the special aspect about all these cases is that a majority of them did not end up in a court uh, verdict so you know uh, since because there is a act which is very much appreciable even by the company so a lot of uh, the key, these cases were uh, you know uh, was taken up as an outside court settlement and though the companies uh, had to release their uh, product uh, source code and then may have to had paid some damages which is not so uh, you know which might have been very huge but it is not so much disclosed outside
so you know maybe we could uh, go into two uh, use cases alone for better understanding what uh, could be a legal suit uh, you know uh, see uh, there can be a startup company which uses a open source code to build his product so later on for that product uh, the startup could be uh, you know acquired by a large corporation so now the whatever product that startup develop is now part of this large corporation the large corporation would continue to sell the product of the uh, uh, startup company but now what happens if the product is not compliant of open source you now the company is going to get sued and for the mistake of not its own uh, so the the prop the whatever uh, the large company has to have done is a proper ip due diligence in this case the open source validation should also have happened but since the company misses out it gets sued and then you know whatever product that it acquired from the startup and the meaning of acquire you know acquisition goes off waste so let's go quickly go into the next uh, example here uh, you know a gpl uh, code is integrated into a chip and then the chip is used in a product and now apart from this gpl code there can be a number of proprietary code because of this integration the company loses out on the entire uh, proprietary over the entire work so because of which you know they face a legal suit uh, and then forced to release the uh, entire code under the gpl license and possibly there could also be damages that has to be paid as well so this was a uh, now brief uh, you know uh, insight about what could be the or risk factor associated with non compliance so let me hand it over to arun who will take you through os services thank you satya hello everyone so i'll quickly touch upon three topics uh, first one is the key elements for os compliance uh, what is that uh, we offer our services and uh, how we typically engage with our customers so let me start with key elements for os compliance So organization should have a structure for OSS compliance. There should be different roles defined at different levels. At top management level, there could be a role called open source compliance officer who takes care of you know, guidelines and so on. Uh, could be the first point of contact for any query from outside. At project level, there could be roles identified for performing OSS compliance related activities. There should be policy defined. So the policy may be different for different legal entities in an organization because it depends mainly on what kind of domain they are working on, what technologies they use, what business they are into. There should be processes as are defined. These may not be similar to the development processes. For example, what is the process to approve an open source component in a product? Who will approve it, and so on. Awareness is one of the critical element in in this OSS compliance. The awareness should be there from top management to the developer level. For instance, if a developer just copies some code and if he or she doesn't fulfill the license term uh, obligations, so there could be huge risks, which my colleagues explained earlier, the kind of risks. There should be infrastructure to manage the all the OSS compliance for related activities. For example, uh, hosting the scan tool or tools for automation, publishing, and so on. The OSS compliance has need to be captured at all levels of product life cycle. For instance, at acquisition phase, there should be agreement with customer for OSS usage in product sources, because finally they are going to fulfill to their users. At design phase, uh, the team has to select what open source components they want to use, what are their licenses, are there any conflicts, what are the obligations they need to fulfill, and so on. During development phase, there should be continuous scanning to make sure that no unapproved licenses are used. During the release, all the license obligations need to be fulfilled, and it doesn't stop here. Even post-release, as long as the product is in the market, organization should make sure that OSS obligations are fulfilled. There should be alignment with supplier, because uh, in case supplier gives uh, the software in, in the form of binary, then supplier, the organization needs to get uh, the OSS related information from the supplier to integrate into the final product of their final disclosure document. Similarly, sales has to be aligned, and there should be some contingency planning in case of any uh, incidents uh, that might occur after the product release. So these are uh, some of the important key elements for OSS compliance. 
so moving on the second topic what are what is that we offer from rbi uh, india we are services offering uh, to cater to the oss compliance needs during different phases of product life cycle as explained earlier we offer to provide draft org structure which can be reviewed and approved by org management we offer uh, drafting oss policy for at different legal entities in an organization we can build a uh, central information repository like oss metadata we offer process consultancy in defining the processes templates workflows that can be used on regular basis we engage with product teams as extended engineering team discuss with them on their delivery dates recommend on scan frequencies perform the code audits uh, we closely work with it team for uh, infrastructure usage we support in publishing like preparing the content for publishing or the source code for publishing we can support even in preparing draft material that can be used for awareness we also support in sales and purchase alignment moving on how we typically engage with customers as i mentioned earlier uh, we engage a standard engineering team uh, for the customer team um, product teams uh, sitting physically at lo uh, customer location this addresses maintaining the confidentiality of the customer assets as all the all the activities are carried out within the customer organization uh, premises usually there is a central oss compliance board within an organization which represents both technical and legal we can have contracts role definitions directly with this central oss compliance board we interact with customer it team for infrastructure infrastructure related needs we interact with product teams in le different legal entities within an organization work with them for regular code audits consultancies etc so that's brief about our services engagement and so on in case if you have a, uh, if you are interested in discussing more about our services then we have a contact mail id which is already mentioned in the slide please write to us thank you over to you arun thank you arun thank you for the detailed explanation on how bosch addresses oss compliance and governance and how other companies can benefit from that information okay now uh, we would like all of our viewers to quickly get res uh, their responses on this poll questions that will be displayed um, please hold on while we display and take you through the poll questions after this we would uh, have the q a session thank you rohan team uh, dear viewers hope you have enjoyed the webinar hosted by bosch india before we move on to the q and a session we would be showing you on your screen a few poll questions each of the questions would appear on your screen one after the other with a 15 seconds gap between them i'll read out each of the questions and you can indicate your responses by clicking on the radio button please note that your responses should not be anonymous here is the first question does your organization have an oss governance office and the options are like yes no don't know not applicable moving on to the second one when entering into a contract with your supplier or customer or the oss requirements captured and approved by the oss office and the third question is does your organization have processes and tools to assess oss vulnerabilities
and moving on to the fourth one in your organization regular awareness sessions conducted to disseminate information regarding oss compliance and vulnerabilities and the fun, final one would be would you like to like bosch to conduct detailed awareness sessions at your organization Over to you, Roy. Thank you. So, thank you, everybody, for answering the poll questions. Uh, now we will move to the Q and A. So, I'd like to take you through some of the questions, and uh, I we would have uh, answers from um, the presenters here. Okay, so first question is from Shankar Prasad, and he's asked, "What is FOS?" Or so I'd request Satya to answer this. Okay, uh, what is FOS? FOS is just an abbreviation. The expansion is free and open source software. So you know, um, when we say it is free and open source software, uh, to uh, for a software to be called as open source software itself, it has to comply with the definition. Established by uh, you no know, OSI, it is called open source uh, definite uh, uh, initiative. Yeah. So once the software is uh, satisfied, uh, satisfy the meaning of uh, you know the whatever uh, is established and kept by first, then they classify as uh, uh, open source. And those are the ones that we generally call it as uh, free and open source software. All right. So let's move on to the next question. Uh, it's from Rajkumar Krishnan, and he's asked, "What are the tools used in clearance of OSS components? Any OSS tool is available." So I'd request Arun to answer this. Yeah. So there are a lot of proprietary tools available. Some of them to name are like Protex, uh, Palamida, Protecode, uh, and so on. Uh, there is also a free uh, tool uh, that is the, called Fossology. Which which mainly works on uh, uh, string search patterns. So yeah, so a lot of uh, as I said, a lot of property tools and maybe one couple of them uh, free tools. Yeah. Thank you, Arun. Uh, let's move on to the next question, and that is from Shankar Prasad, and he's asked, "What is MPL?" Arun, could you please answer that? Okay, let me take the question. So, you know, MPL uh, is again an uh, abbreviation. Uh, it is called Mozilla Public License. So, you know, the, it is one of the popular license uh, which you know widely uh, present, and uh, it is one of the weak popular license wherein you know uh, the modifications might have to, the you know code when it is used as is, or you know when the modified, the content uh, has to be relicensed under the same license. So pretty much uh, that would work, I think. Yeah, you could move on to the next question. All right, now we have an interesting question from Manu Sharma, and he's asked, how can one know the patents in a software? So I don't think you could answer that as well. Yeah, so you know, patents in a software, uh, generally uh, talking just not about patents alone. Uh, you know, when you, when someone has to research on a patent, if it exists or not, there has to be a proper validation that has to be taken up. Uh, you know, uh, there is a, a lot of public search uh, portals that is available or maintained by the patent office of each uh, country or the territory where the patent was granted. So a uh, sub so basic search has to be done there to evaluate whether uh, there is a possibility of patent being granted on that subject matter. So in in this case, if a software uh, patent is possible, then you know. Uh, Accordingly, you know the search has to be done. So and and it depends on whichever area that 
you know you are focusing to uh, have the search to be done you know if for example in india the a patent could be granted it essentially does not mean that it should be available in the rest of the world so in individual territories the patent search has to be done yeah thank you arun so uh, we have a lot of questions posting in i just want to remind everybody that if you'd like to uh, email us we'll be more than happy to answer your queries and since we have a shortage of time we'll take a couple of more questions um we have a question from kartikeyan kandasami and he's asked should the prop, uh, proprietary code publish even when a portion of code is copied say from a gpl okay um, you know a proprietary code is copied in the sense you know there there are various ways uh, in which uh, code is used in a um, in a product so in a proprietary development if uh, a code could be copied as snippet it could be linked or you know there is only a dependency of an executable you know the gpl is gpl code forms as a separate executable wherein the call of an executable is from the proprietary code so you know when uh, when you mean that a, co a code is copied into the proprietary code or uh, linked then definitely the entire proprietary code as well has to be released under gpl but uh, the later case where i explained if it is just going to be a, a call of an executable in such cases i don't think it is necessary okay uh, we would take one last question since our time's nearly up uh, but i'd like to acknowledge questions uh, from shankar prasad venkatarao gadam nitin shashi santil kumar s prashant soni uh, amit vikram jagan mohan k and uh, others so um, as mentioned uh, we would love for you to get in touch with us with the email that will be shown later but for one last final question and the question is can you elaborate little more on the need for oss compliance after product release that is from shankar prasad i'll take it up so uh, i'll uh, explain it within a scenario let's say if somebody is using a strong copyleft license where one of the term is to distribute the source code so in this way in this scenario when the product is released for different versions of the products that are released the source code has to be provided so uh, you can maintain it uh, uh, there are different scenarios how you could do it either you could distribute the uh, uh, dvd along with the product uh, or let's say if after the product is in the market if somebody has a query that uh, they they still need the source code of a particular version this has to be maintained so there should be some kind of a support system for example maybe a email id or a or a phone number where uh, even any uh, later after the release also if somebody asks a source code then uh, the, they should be able to reach uh, your organization and your organization able to respond and provide whatever is uh, required with respect to the distribution fulfillment thank you arun um so we still have more questions coming in and i'd encourage you one last time to please reach out to us through um the email that's shown on the screen right now and that is oss-support@in.bosch.com that is oss-support@in.bosch.com um we would be happy to answer all your queries and uh, if you would like us to visit your organization to give um presentation on awareness or the processes that were described here we'd be more than happy to do that uh, this webinar and the ppt will be available at the link shown on the screen right now um, uh, just give us a few days to compile the video and uh, make the whole video as well uh, available on screen thank you all for your questions and for your participation uh, please give us your feedback after this webinar ends thank you once again have a good evening